far things going? Two more episodes before the volume is over, and so far things have been getting better and better. It's no surprise that many people see this as the best volume. And while that's debatable for certain aspects, I have to admit that Rooster Teeth have been taking chances. First with Pierre's hard decision, then with Framing Yang, then with the destruction of Penny, and now with the possible fall of Beacon and Veil. Vale. So many, so many of my waifus in danger. Rooster Teeth better not fuck with any more of them. Well, same with what happened last time, I don't think that'd be the case, but let's find out. And we got our first intern to do the recap for us, so take it away, Mr. Shinoda. Thank you, Ricardo! Previously on Ruby, our dastardly villains began their onslaught on the City of Vale. However, our heroes are still reeling after the sudden destruction of their robotic companion, Penny Paladina. But the creatures of Grimm give them no time to mourn as they surround the stadium. The young huntress Ruby Rose then rallies her comrades as they leave the doomed enmity Coliseum to protect the helpless citizens. However, with the White Fang still governing the skies, General James Ironwood boards a ship to take them back. The only one of his helicarriers still left flying is currently under the control of the con artist Roman Torchwick. With the help of his lolly little one, they managed to seize command over the Atlesium Knights, turning them against those that they were built to defend. With Ironwood in a hot situation, it is up to Ruby to finish the job. And good luck to her, for back on the ground her friends are finding it difficult to fight against the combined might of the White Fang, the Grim, and now the cybernetic soldiers. It seems like Miss Belladonna and Miss Schnee are able to hold their own together, but it looks like they must part ways as the Ice Queen goes to deal with an Elysium Paladin, while Bella Bodhi chases after an Alpha Grim. However, as she tries to deal with the beast, another beast from her past shows up. Her old friend and mentor, Adam Taurus. And it looks like she's not the only one having to deal with personal conflict, as Pierre Nikos discovers Ozpin gazing at her. From his solemn look, she understands that with all the chaos going on, the people in danger, and with a new threat of a giant grim dragon, the time has come for her to take the mantle of Guardian, to become the next Fall Maiden. However, as she and Jean Arc follow the headmaster back into the school, the sinister Cinder Falls now knows the location of her prey. Will Cinder be able to steal the rest of the Fall Maiden's powers? Will Blake be able to confront her former friend? Will Ruby be able to shut down Roman's control over the knights? Will Rooster Teeth be able to end this all on a positive note and not rip our hearts out? Well, even with the White Fang and Grim everywhere, as long as the Amnity Coliseum and I are still on the air, I will be there to bring you all the latest scoops. So find out now with me, Jenna Shinoda, on... One of the White Fang members is in the booth with me right now, folks. He is leveling one of those glove devices at me. He is looking confused at my continued narration. Now he is looking angry at another one of Ricardo's sets of a popular show. He's approaching me with his hand outstretched now, and I believe he is about to electrocute me! I am currently shitting my- Wow, that's sad. He had kids, didn't he? Well, if he did die, then it's kind of poetic as your portrayal of him was dying. Well, let's see if any of our characters meet the same fate. Here's open that Mercury literally bites the bullet that Yang fires. The come on, roll the clip. Why do you keep showing me the intro, man? I wouldn't expect a normie to know. Skip. Back with the show, we see Ruby staring in shock at the newcomer. But this is interrupted by a griffin. As the beast is defeated, she turns to see Neil informing Roman of the arrival of Little Red. And I guess you guys know what's coming next. Oh my god, lolly fight! <laughs> We are not doing that! We are not doing that! Moving on! Well, like the fussy daddy he is, Roman shows up to give his kid an unfair advantage. Ruby tries to ask him some fan questions, like why does Roman want to destroy Vale? How is that going to help him? What is to be gained by it? And Roman says that it's not what he will gain, but that he can't afford to lose. Man. But even I know there are some bets you just don't take. The people that hired me are going to change the world. You know the old saying, if you can't beat them... <gasps> nah, I can't say I've heard that one before. I mean, I've heard if you can't beat them, join them. And I've heard if you want a little love, 
Call Neo. Yeah, that too. But I can't say I've heard of yours, Roman. With the odds even, Ruby declares that she will stop him. But it looks like people were right with her being an aqua without her sight. Roman then tells her that this is a cruel world that doesn't care about you, and if she wants to be a hero, then she should be more like her mom and just die and get it over with. As for me, I'll do what I do best. Lie, steal, cheat, and survive! No! Roman! Oh god, well, Grim don't have stomach, so maybe he's alright. Fuck. And with that, she became little Neo No Daddy. Which, incidentally, is the title of a mm, manga I'm uh, working on. And yep, with that one explosion, the shit starts to crash. That's Ford Manufacturing for ya, people! While Ruby decides that she's not willing to go down with the ship, so she grabs Christian Rose, leaps from the aircraft, and pulls off a move that would make Hannibal proud. Incidentally, if she could bunny hop her way down, why was she so worried about falling? I mean, it's not like she couldn't get back on the ship or hasn't fallen like this before. Well, fake criticisms to get you guys hate posting aside, I'm sure I'll get something in the comment section who doesn't get the joke. But back on the ground, we see Adam confronting Blake. As Blake takes a step back, Adam asks if she's become a scaredy cat. <laughs> I get it, that's it. That's a good one. Saying that they were supposed to change the world. Uh, bro, there's a difference between changing the world and killing it. We were destined to light the fires of revolution. Ugh. Consider this the spark. Uh, dude, look around you. Fire's been burning so long that the Billy Joel joke has gotten old. Anywho, Blake stops Adam, saying that she's done running. But Emo God replies with, No, you're not. Once a pussy, always a pussy. Explains her relationships. Adam couldn't handle her, so she had to go find a real man. We then cut the Velvet's ass. There is a god. As we discover that even though Rooster Teeth has shown them to be far more powerful than this, the students are having a hard time dealing with the combined forces of the Grimm and Atlas's Robo Troops. You guys remember the time when Coco alone tore through a legion of Grimm, worse than a super chili cheese fried burrito tears through my digestive system? Good times, man. Good times. Well, I guess they're just having a hard time against the updated versions of the Paladin. Coco then tells Playboy Bunny that now is the time for her to use her ultimate weapon. And if it's anything like I think it is, this is gonna be awesome. What are you doing? She's going to get hurt. Just watch. Yeah, Ice Queen, chill out. It's all gonna be cool. No need to freeze up about this or get an ice cold feeling about the not ice puns that I'm shoveling out. Winter is coming! Well, it's just going to do what most YouTubers do. Blatantly copy and steal other people's work. <laughs> How does it feel? Sucks, doesn't it? Tell me about it! And suddenly, like college life, reality, bitch! Well, upon seeing everybody's bunny waifu get kicked in the frickin' face, Ice Queen decides no more Mrs. Nice Twice as she leaps into the action, summoning a giant arm which cuts the paladin in two. However, things are just getting started as an Ed 9 turns the corner and rushes the group. What?! Are you fucking kidding me?! We then cut to Glinda Crow and a surprisingly not dead Cardin, who is saved by Robocop. Crow then angrily leaps towards Ironwood, who pleads that he isn't responsible for the robot attack, but Crow's target is the suddenly appearing Griffin. Gotta hate those randomly spawned enemies. Crow knows that his friend the Tin Man isn't responsible for this, and Ironwood explains that the dragon seems focused only on the school, so they need to get the students out of Beacon. Crow, I'm leaving that to you and my men. I still need to get to my ship. Cue comedic moment! Won't be much of a walk. <laughs> and as you might expect, with the central control ship down, the robots go all Phantom Menace on us. I thought we learned our lesson. You went full prequel, man. You never go full prequel. Well, Yang shows up, and upon hearing where Blink went, she chases after the kitty. Chasing after pussy. My girl. Well, hopefully she gets there soon, because the emotionally conflicted Blake is finding it hard to fight against Adam. 
I will make it my mission to destroy everything you love. Wait. Starting with her. Oh, that's not gonna end well for you, man. Well, Adam stabs Blake. Rape! Oh, wait, wrong kind of stab. Domestic abuse! Kill him, Yang! To get Yang's attention. Get away from her! Oh. Don't worry, Blake, you'll get over his death. Yang, kill him! <laughs> oh, your ass is grass, fool! <laughs> yeah, Yang, kill his mother! I'm sorry, what? Um, uh, nah, I'm sorry, I still don't understand. Nope, still not getting it. Uh, huh. Hmm. 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 Mom, I need a ticket to Texas! There's some pendejos I have to kill! No, mijo, you have your cousin's quinceanera tomorrow. But mama, they cut off an arm of a fictional character I really like! No, no, we're going to stay here. Mom, they mutilated my wife, ho! Fuck it, I'm going! Don't you yell at your mama! If I say you're not going, you're not going! Sleep in fear, rooster teeth. Sleep in fear. And you know what? After that, I don't even want to finish the review. Fuck you, I'm out! No, 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 we're not having happy music here. Fuck Rooster Teeth! Okay, fine, we'll finish it. Well, Blake leaps in to defend Yang. I don't even have it in me to make a bumblebee joke. Adam takes a swipe at his ex, but it turns out it was a decoy as she escapes with Yang's limp body. However, Adam doesn't give chase. That smug ass motherfucking piece of sh**. <sighs> positive thoughts, positive thoughts. There are no more positive thoughts, what am I talking about? Back with Oz and the kids, John is a little confused by the underground cathedral and the half-dead hooker. But like he tells Glinda, Osmond says there's no time for explanations as Pyrrha jumps into the pod. Are you ready? I need to hear you say it. Yes. Thank you, Miss Nikos. Ozpin then begins the transfer, and at Pear's cry of pain, John becomes distracted for a moment. But a moment can be a lifetime, and ironically, this time, it claims a life. <gasps> and upon her death, the maiden's powers return to its other half, giving Cinder a feeling that previously only Mr. Buzzbuzz could give. That or Emerald, depending on who you ask. Seeing her senpai in danger, Para leaps to engage, but Osman tells them both to leave, to find Crow and Glinda and Ironwood, and to bring them here. Tower cannot fall. But I can help. You'll only get in the way. Cinder, however, doesn't even bother with Jean and Pira, as her main quarry lies before her. This whole time, right beneath our feet, she was right about you. Such arrogance. And of course, we end it on a cliffhanger. And that's the end of the episode! Fuck you guys, I'm done! Get back here, you pansy! No! I'm not feeling it, man! Neither am I! You think I'm okay with this? But... Talk! Is what you're good at! Explain why this episode made you feel the way you feel, and why Rooster Teeth will shortly be having a few more deaths in the company. Talk, and get the pain out. Fine. As much as I don't want to say it, it is to the show's benefit that they're willing to take a dark course like this with no going back. Most shows either jump into this tone with no warning or set things up as irrationally changing to slate the desires of the writers. But Ruby has hinted to this dark side of the show from the beginning with the introductory narration and the signs of a ruined history to the fall of Mountain Glen and what they have to build to protect themselves. Even the music, especially in Volume 1, told us that things were eventually going to end up like this. We should have known. Why didn't we listen?
However, I'm still in pain, so we're going to talk about something that really pissed me off this episode. Character ability inconsistency. This is a trope that anime of all shows, or genres if you have to, wears like an otaku wears a favorite Hatsune Miku t-shirt at Comic-Con, obnoxiously shouting out quotes and references in a screeching tone. One moment a character, regardless of hero or villain, will show a case of extreme skill or power, and then the next they become total noobs. And worse is the reverse, where a character, normally the hero, just out of the blue becomes an untouchable badass like they popped in Game Shark and activated hacks mode. Now it's fine to have if you don't want to take yourself seriously and just want to have a bit of fun. But the moment you add a story element or try to have a suspenseful moment, it can very easily cripple our suspension of disbelief. You want to have Velvet take out the Paladin? Fine. But don't show us them wiping the floor against everyone else's combined strength. As cool and nostalgic as this moment was, it's marred by the fact that she rips through them almost without effort in spite of what we just saw. And this isn't the only moment this trope comes up. As there was Ruby getting her ass kicked, Roman's lapse of awareness, Coco's nerfed ammo, everyone else's nerfed strength, Weiss's sudden summoning, Blake's unexpected ineptitude, Yang's dumb disarmament, sleep in fear, Rooster Teeth and the robot's sudden desire to reenact the ending of George Lucas's first stage of cancer. Some of these moments can be defended, explained by the character's abilities or inabilities. Take Velvet's moment for example. While it isn't consistent that the robot's owning everyone else left, right, and center, but somehow she's able to take them down no problemo, it's understandable why she would be knocked out by a single blow. She's a glass cannon, can dish it out but can't take it, which is a similar situation with Ruby. Again, people like to think that her abilities are inconsistent. But what is inconsistent is the level of brain power these idiots have who can't wrap their minds around the fact that a strong character can be brought down simply by their weaknesses. I believe those are the same people we find complaining in the comments of Death Battle. Fucking idiots. Of course Goku would lose to Superman. He's nothing more than a pansy ass Japanese ripoff. Ruby is no powerhouse and was already weary from fighting Grimm, and we've seen Neil take on and down Yang, so Ruby stood no chance against the two combined. Even Roman alone could hold his own against Little Red, as all Ruby really has is speed, and that can only last so long. Eventually, through harsh and dirty tactics, Roman would be the main man. Before becoming the main meal. Yeah, it's a shock to see Bruce's teeth kill off one of their most popular characters. But is Roman really dead? I'm going to leave it as a maybe. This is a little different than with Penny's case, who is clearly alive, if Rooster Teeth has any semblance of intelligence left. But for Roman? Honestly, it doesn't matter. If Rooster Teeth keeps him and simply uses this event as a method for him and Neo to escape Cinder's control, that would be interesting to explore, as well as having an intriguing predicament of Roman possibly becoming a good guy. Or, at the very least, an anti-hero. However, if they do let this be the end of his tale, then it is a bold and equally right move to make. The only reason we had Roman for so long was because he became a fan favorite character. Initially, he was only to play a small part in the first volume, but then Rooster T saw just how much the people loved him and how great of an antagonist he was. So they decided to give him a part to play in the next two volumes as well. And either way, this reinforces the notion that no character is safe if they are willing to kill off Roman and mutilate Yang. Sleep in fear, Rooster Teeth. It drives into our hearts a real sense of dread. Ruby has done something that most shows strive to achieve. To get us emotionally and mentally invested into all the characters. There are very few of them that Ruby viewers in general don't like. So like your collection of figurines, you don't want to lose any of them or see them hurt. And I've danced around the subject enough, so let's talk about Yang's injury. Sleep in fear, Rooster Teeth. The most criticism this scene gets is, how? It falls back on the character ability inconsistency. How was Adam able to cut off Yang's arm? Wouldn't her aura stop it? What is the point in telling us that they have a shield if it doesn't protect them? Well, someone's been playing too many video games. I don't have a problem, fuck you. And fuck you too, DG Jeff. You will not beat my peckle score. Aura is a shield, in the sense that it is additional armor. It protects them by reducing the blow. Just because you wear a bulletproof vest doesn't mean that you're not going to feel anything. If we were to take this as something that would exist and thus have to abide by some laws of physics, not that anime has ever given a damn about that, then Aura would act like a dampener, reducing the blow taken, not taking it entirely. 
The most well known of this trope is Halo, where your shield and your health are two different things. Only when your shield is down will you start taking damage to your health. But those are games where certain liberties have to be taken and certain realities ignored to make it fun. But in shows like Ruby, we've seen characters feel a blow even though their aura hadn't been depleted. So if there was something that could cut straight through a weakened aura, likelihood is that it's going to keep going through whatever the aura was protecting. Which in this case was my fucking heart. How could you do this to my wife who roots your teeth? Ricardo's right. Sleep in fear. Cause I'll be there to turn your dreams into nightmares. And your nightmares, nightmares into hell. And while in my book, this scene will go down as one of the worst things to happen to a character in Ruby, it again shows Rooster Teeth's willingness to take chances and put not only some genuine threat to even our main characters, but to also leave a lasting impact that they will have to deal with. Sure, some people think that death is worse, but again, death is final. Life is full of possibilities. Yang lost an arm. There is no fixing that. She is going to have to live with it as well as the painful memories of losing it for the rest of her life. And I'm not going to talk about the Bumblebee strippers because I want to save that for a later video. And because I know that anything less than Blake's marriage to Sun will only fuel the fire in your crotches. Well, there's always the 100% possibility that she's bi. No, but I will talk about Blake and her relationship with Adam. Again, like a broken record, we have people complaining why she wasn't able to stand up against him, and how could she get stabbed if her aura was still active? For the latter, see previous. But the former was explained to us in the last season. Blake has had a very hard time confronting those that she loves. She'd rather run away than have to deal with that emotional conflict. So, it's clear why she wasn't able to hold her own against Adam. She's a girl, and they're weaker than guys. <laughs> 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 But no, being a girl wouldn't play some part in this, but the major issue is that he was once her old friend, and from what we can guess from his words, perhaps her love. I said way back in my black trailer review, that was more of an episode than a trailer, that Blake and Adam's relationship may go deeper than what is seen on the surface. And judging by his ability, but resistance to chase after an injured Blake carrying an unconscious Yang might hint to the fact that he's not over it either. True, his way of dealing with his pain and changing the world may be what some people would call going a bit too far, but it's clear that he's a man in pain that is irrationally lashing out in anger at a world and woman that hurt him. And it does seem like Garen Hunter may be able to emote these emotions, if given someone to talk to. While Adam's monologues still feel like something that a third grader wrote, his dialogues with Blake are more believable and bring us back to Rutiti's relationship building abilities. It may go to why they have a hard time writing villains, as they have to keep them in the shadows, as our main characters don't know them yet. But occasionally when they do interact with each other, we get moments like this, where they are humanized, where we are reminded that even a villain had a past and wants a future. Well, he might not get one. I was saving this spell to turn me human again, but it's worth it if it sends his soul to the depths of Satan's sex dungeon. He's a fictional character, dude. God. Damn it. However, speaking about our character's past, it seems that we might have gotten some more about Cinder. She now has the Fall Maiden's powers, which may lead to some sort of climactic showdown in the next episode. <laughs> climactic. But she lets slip some words that mean very little to those who have no context. However, if we read in between the lines, we see the hurt and pain that underlines her words. Again, great ideas, poor implementation. But the seventh episode revealed to us that this world may have hurt Cinder, making her feel powerless and afraid, something that she is desperate to never feel again. And because of that, she seems to have gone to someone who could give her the power to never feel powerless. Someone who could rid her of her fears, as they control the beasts of fear. Someone that Osman knows. As to whom this is, we only have the faintest of clues to her doings, but not to her identity. Perhaps Cinder will reveal more in the next episode, but... For now, it's a shame that we have to be left in the dark. And to be honest, guys, I'm not sure if I want to review it. Not after what's happened. Something tells me that you will. Unless the assassin that the Ruby fanbase sent kills you first. But in any course, guys, thanks for watching. Please give this video a like and support me on Patreon so that I can make more of these videos for you. I'm Ricardo, the Cynical Critic, and... I need to go lay down. I NEED ICE CREAM IN A NOVA VIDEO STAT!
Hey, you wanna go swim with your little fishes, miss? You go right ahead. Me? I'm opening this door and I'm climbing out of here. The hell you are. Hey, I don't work for you anymore, okay? I don't have to keep your orders. That's enough now from all of you. Now you've seen how bad things can get and how quick they can get that way. Well, they can get a whole lot worse. So we're not going to fight anymore. We're going to pull together and we're going to find a way to get out of here. First, we're going to seal off this room.